So before we talk about the count min sketch, we need to talk about one more mathematical idea, which is Markov's inequality. This video really will sort of stand on its own as just a brief introduction to Markov's inequality. Okay, so let's take a look at a statement from an academic study. So the statement is, when more than 90% of faculty members rate themselves as above average teachers and two-thirds rate themselves among the top quarter, the outlook for much improvement in teaching seems less than promising. Okay, so that's a, a kind of an amusing statement. Let's take the editorial part and put it aside. There's two statements about a data set here. Um, more than 90% of faculty members rate themselves as above average teachers and two-thirds rate themselves among the top quarter. Two different statements. Okay, so let's look at the first one. Well, for, let's, let's put on our thinking hats and let's look at the first one. More than 90% of faculty members rate themselves as above average teachers. So that sounds silly, right? Because there's something silly about the idea that, uh, you know, 90% of everyone thinks they're above average. Now, drilling down into that statement a little bit more, is it even possible for it to be true? Well, I sort of have a series of thoughts about that. So first of all, I think, well, no, that's not, there's no way that's true, right? That, that they have it wrong, right? They think too much of themselves. But then the next thing I think is, oh, maybe it is possible. And then the next thing I think is, I guess it depends on what you mean by average. And that's one of the points of this lecture is we need to, we actually need to say what we mean when we say average. Most of the time when people say average, they mean mean, like the arithmetic mean. But sometimes when people say average, they mean median. You know, they mean something about the, mi the uh, middle of, of the data points in a data set. Okay, so let's go to the second statement. Two-thirds rate themselves among the top quarter. Now here, there's no question about whether we mean an arithmetic mean as the average or whether we mean something in terms of the quantiles of the data. Clearly, you know, these people are rating themselves in the top quarter and you can't possibly have two-thirds of people actually in the top quarter, right? So that's a statement where we can definitely say, no, you know, the, the, these, these uh, faculty are incorrect. They are not two-thirds of them in the top quarter. Here's another example. I think this is the one I hear most often. Sometimes you'll hear people say something like, 90% of everyone rates themselves an above-average driver. Okay, so we're not picking on teachers anymore. Now we're talking about drivers. Um, and this is a data set that some of these statements are based on. This is a survey of people in um, the U.S. and in Sweden. And they were asked, how do they rate themselves in terms of these are deciles, so ranges of percentiles, 0 to 10, 11 to 20, etc. cetera. Um, where do you think you are as a driver in terms of safety and skill? Okay, and if you look at the deciles that correspond to uh, the quantiles that are greater than the median, right, the, the 50th percentile, more than half of the people place themselves in these upper, in these upper deciles, right? So more than three quarters of the uh, people in the U.S. and in Sweden put themselves in the um, top half on safety and then this many for skill, okay? So here there's no question we're talking about the, uh, when I highlight these columns here, I'm saying these are the counts of people who consider themselves to be in the upper half greater than the median. And of course, we can't really have more than half the data be greater than the median, right? These are just, it's an indication that these drivers think too much of themselves, right? Okay, so with those two examples in mind, let's now ask a question. Is it possible to have a data set, you know, maybe it's the teaching evaluation scores for a bunch of teachers, is it possible for more than half of the data points to be greater than the mean of all the data points? Right, the mean as in the arithmetic mean, you know, add them up and divide by the number of points. Is this possible? Yes, definitely. So let's just take a really simple data set where we have six teachers and their teaching evaluation ratings are one and then five tens. Okay. So what's the arithmetic mean? Well, it's just somewhat less than 10, but five out of the six data points are greater than that. Five out of the six data points are 10. So five out of the six data points are greater than that. So yeah, absolutely. We can have more than half of the data points be greater than the mean of the data points. Now, 
Is it possible for more than half of the data points to be greater than the median? No. And that's just by definition of the median, right? If we take the data points and put them in order and pick the one in the middle, that's the median. If we say that more than half of the data are greater than the median, that means it's not in the middle, right? So it's, uh, it, the contradiction means that no, this is not possible. Okay, so there's a big difference between whether we're talking about mean or median here. But now let's, even though we said, yes, it is possible for more than half the data to be greater than the mean, let's now think about the mean, but let's go beyond just, by, uh, let's go beyond just asking whether the data are greater than the mean. Let's ask if the data are much greater than the mean. Okay, so here's a related question. Is it possible for more than half of the data to be more than twice the mean? Now, let me draw a picture. And we're going to think about the data points as uh, in terms of where they uh, fall on this picture. And an important point is um, the leftmost point on my diagram here is zero. All right, so these. Uh, these data points, let's say they're teaching evaluation uh, scores or something like that, we're assuming they're non-negative, all right? They're zero or greater. Okay, so in those circumstances, is it possible for more than half the data to be greater than the mean? In other words, uh, let's just uh, put some of the data points right here. Let's just draw sort of like a peak here, right? So there's some number of data points out here just beyond the mean times two. Okay, and now let's say, okay, well, in order for this to be possible, I kind of need to sort of like counterbalance it as, be as best as I can on the low end so that the mean ends up being uh, here in the middle. Uh, so where do I want to put the rest of the weight? I want to put the rest of the data points sort of as close to zero as I possibly can. But it won't work, right? Because even if half the data points are here and half the data points are here, the fact that this is beyond the mean times two means that the mean is going to have been dragged a little bit to the right. It's not going to be on that point in the middle. It's going to be dragged a little bit off to the high end of the scale. All right. So this isn't possible. It's not possible for more than half of the data to be greater than two times the mean in this situation where the data are all non-negative. Okay. Likewise, it's not possible for um, a third of the data, for, for more than a third of the data, to be more than three times the mean. Same reason, right? It'll drag the mean higher. It's a contradiction because you'll have dragged the mean higher, right? So it's not possible for more than a third of the data to be over three times the mean. It's not possible for more than a quarter of the data to be more than four times the mean, etc. To our equation for Markov's inequality, which says that for a non-negative random variable x, so you can think of this random variable as representing the data set um, in our previous examples, and it's important that it's a non-negative random variable. All right, the probability that a value from the data set is greater than or equal to b times the mean, b times the expected value, is at most 1 over b. That's a little bit like saying for a concrete data set, that the fraction of data points that are greater than b times the expected value is at most 1 over b. Okay, but we've just sort of shifted into talking about it like a random variable. Okay, so this matches the uh, way that we were phrasing it before when we said no more than half the data can be twice the mean and no more than a third of the data can be three times the mean. There's another popular way to write this down, though, if we just do a little change of variable. Let's let a be b times the expected value of the random variable. OK. Then the probability now that x is greater than or equal to a, this new variable, is at most. Now I need to take the 1 over b that we had up here and figure out what it is after this change of variable. Well. It looks like divide both sides by b, divide both sides by a, that's going to turn out 1 over b is going to be expected value of x over a. So that's another way to write it that you'll see. Okay, now we say early on that our random variable x has to be non negative. So why does it have to be non negative? Well, let's say 
let's say for a moment that x doesn't have to be non-negative. It could take on positive or negative values. Right? We're trying to make a statement about what fraction of the data is allowed to be extreme, is allowed to be greater than some number times the expected value. Well, if some of the values are allowed to be negative, then you can pick whatever extreme value you want, right? whatever extreme multiple of the expected value you want, and you can always counterbalance that with a data point that's extremely negative. Like for example, you know, let's say we wanted to say, we wanted to make a statement about whether a data point could be as high as a million times the mean. Well, a million times the mean, whatever it is, there's a negative that, and there's some chance that the data set includes a value that's just as extreme, but of the opposite sign, in which case we, it's counterbalanced with respect to the mean, and we can't really say that it's not possible to have that extreme value. So the key is when the random variable is allowed to be negative, the problem is whatever extreme positive value we might pick, it can be counterbalanced by an extreme negative value. You know, it can be counterbalanced by a value that's just as extreme, but of the opposite sign. Okay, so the, the Markov inequality is something that we can use. It's very general. The Markov inequality, uh, really, the only assumption that it's making about this random variable x is that it's non-negative. All right? So if we want to use Markov's inequality, really all we need is we need for it to make sense that we can think of x as non-negative, and we probably need to know its expected value, right? We need to be able to get at its expected value in order for this bound to tell us something. So the strength is, our only assumption here is that the random variable is non-negative, maybe like, you know, uh, uh, how good a driver you are can be expressed on a scale that goes from zero up to positive numbers, how good a teacher you are. Um, in fact, a lot of things, uh, uh, you know, even if this didn't apply for some variable, it would be applied for that variable squared, right? So sometimes you can take a variable that will take on some negative values, but you can transform it in a reasonable way to turn it into a variable that only takes positive values. So the only assumption is that the random variable is non-negative. That's not a terribly onerous assumption. And the only thing we really have to know in order for this bound to, to do something, to tell us something, is we need to know the expected value of the random variable. And as we've seen, thanks to, for example, linearity of expectation, it's often easier to take a complicated random variable, uh, which might be a sum or a weighted sum of simpler random variables, and talk only in ter and figure out its expected value. Right? That might be a much easier thing to do than to say something more analytical about its probability function, for example. Okay, so those are the strengths. So what's the main weakness? The weakness is that this isn't always really a tight or useful bound. So like the example I uh, like to give is, um, let's say we have a room full of kindergarten children, uh, 10 kindergarten children, and we know that their average age um, is five and a half years old, right? So they're sort of, uh, uh, their average age is five and a half. So that means in that scenario, none of the children can be more than 55 years old. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, I think we knew that already, right? In other words, in this scenario where we're talking about a room full of kindergarten children, we don't just, in, in a typical scenario, we don't just know the expected value. We don't just know the average age of the children in that room. We just know, because of the scenario, because it's a kindergarten classroom, that they're within a tight range. We know they're probably some of them are five and some of them are six and maybe some of them are a little bit older or younger. But we know they're not all over the map. We know there's no 55 year olds in a kindergarten room uh, unless they're the teacher. Uh, so the point here is that because Markov's inequality is, is uh, giving us a bound but only with respect to the expected value of the random variable, that is a double-edged sword that makes it easier to apply because we often know the expected value, but it makes it a not very tight bound because in order to achieve a tighter bound, we would have to probably bring in some information about the variance of that random variable, how much it varies. And in the case of kids in a kindergarten classroom, we know that the variance should not be very large. 
therefore it should be possible to apply a much tighter bound than the one we got here. Um, so there are other uh, uh, concentration bounds and things like Markov's inequality, but that use the variance of a random variable as well in order to achieve stronger bounds. So for example, Chebyshev's inequality would be an example of this. Now we only need Markov's inequality uh, for our proof about the Countman sketch, so this is where we're going to stop.